And I was like, uh, I heard you needed some guys. You know, that was the best line I could come up with. Hurt my knee real bad. <laughs> like, this is not good. Right. And so they're like. Sometimes what seems like the worst day of our lives or the worst possible situation is actually the thing that can propel us into the future that God has for our lives. That's the story actually of Brian, who's going to be joining me today. And we're going to hear his story, how something that at the moment he thought was maybe the worst thing, something that, that no human being would ever want to experience. But you're going to hear his incredible story, how he took something that was such a terrible experience. And now how that story has actually not just changed his life, but has changed it to be something totally different, totally better in so many ways than he ever could have imagined. So Brian, thank you so much for being here, man. Thanks, Excited thanks for, for you to, to be with us today. So I guess let's go back before. So, you know, you didn't, you didn't uh, grow up necessarily dreaming of being in the army. You didn't grow up being GI Joe. So tell me you, what age did you decide to go down to the recruiting station and enlist? Uh, when I was 18, I wasn't really your, uh, I wasn't a church boy by any means growing up, you know, did what I think most 18 year olds do, tried college, failed out, was too busy partying to, to go to class. What was interesting though is like, it led me to these sales jobs and then it led me to working at a place called uh, Modernier in Niles, Michigan, which built Humvee parts oh, okay. for AM General who assembled them All right. for the military. At the time I was drinking a lot. Uh, I worked from three to 10 and I would go to the bar from 10, 15 until three in the morning. And my now wife was my girlfriend at the time uh, and she was tired of it. Yeah, uh, she was a good girl. She was raised in a church. She, the one argument we or the arguments that we ever had were she wanted to go to church and I wanted to go drinking. And yeah. so, she let me make my own decisions. She never, you know, told me you will go this that, and the other. And there was one morning that I think it was like six a.m. and I was coming in, um, and there was a note that just said like things need to change. And so I laid down to go to sleep and I couldn't sleep and I just kept thinking about that note and I kept thinking about how close I was to losing her. And so uh, I made the decision that, you know, I always wanted to serve and now was the time. So you end up at Fort Campbell and you're now officially going to be deploying, right? And it's told you're going to Afghanistan. I could have never predicted that I would show up on March 10th, 2010 and find out that I was deploying May 2010. Wow, so a really short turn time. Yeah, we get boots on the ground, they push us out to the Argandab River Valley uh, in Kandahar. And uh, I got set up in this fob, and like I had this, <clears throat> we had they had taken this old school, and they had turned it into our, uh, well, our CP, our control, I just forgot the name, TOC, there we go. Okay. Um, which is our operating center. Through some series of unfortunate events, uh, somebody had been hurt in one of the maneuver platoons, and so they sent me out to the maneuver platoon. Got um, it. And so, so now you're going out <clears throat> outside the wire for the first time, really. That's right. In a in a in a group that you know, like, okay, we're likely to encounter that's small right. arms fire. We're likely to encounter IEDs, all that kind of stuff. Well, where we were, like, um, and you were doing a lot of dismounted patrols, so you were doing a lot of this on foot. Yeah. So we were out on patrol. Uh, it was a night patrol. And at the time, I was operating as the point man because I was the team leader. Right. So we were moving in a file, one after the other, about three to five meters apart, okay. spaced out. And I was number one man. So yeah. I was the first guy. My only job is to make sure that everybody behind me is clear to walk, that they don't step on an IED. And so as we're maneuvering, I step in a hole. Uh, it was like a little wadi where the water was running down through. Step in a hole. When I step in a hole, like... My knee sounded like a bull whip, uh, and I was like, oh, man. Something's bad. Yeah, this is not normal. Literally, uh, my team, my squad leader and my platoon sergeant get up and they're like, what are you doing? And I was like, hurt my knee real bad. <laughs> like, yeah. this is not good. Right. And so they're like, keep moving. So the Bravo team leader moves up, takes point. We keep moving. So it's me, Doc, and the platoon sergeant. Trying to keep up. Try to hobble along. Uh, we get to where we were supposed to go. We set up an overwatch and we hung out for a bit. And like the whole time we were hanging out, uh, I just felt the throbbing in my knee and yeah. I could feel it growing. And I'm like, man, this is not good. Yeah. Not good at all. Right. But um, you finished the mission. We did. Um, yeah. 
So you finish the mission. We get back and that's when they started to take a look at me and then they set me up to the FOB. Right, so now you're at the FOB and they say, you're gonna have to get this more. Yeah, you gotta go to Kandahar. You gotta go to Kandahar. And so the Calf. only way to get you to, to Calf Kandahar area is you're going to either fly or you're gonna ride. In theory, yes. And so we're not too far outside of Calf. And I'll never forget this, man. Like the guy across from me, I won't say his name, he opens up his laptop and he's playing Juicy by Biggie Smalls. Okay, as you do. Yeah, and so, and everybody's going crazy, like everybody's singing along, everybody's- How's the song go? Uh, nope, not on camera. And so, next thing you know, like everything just went black. Uh, so the vehicle uh, rolled down a ravine. So I had fractured vertebrae in my neck. Uh, I had uh, done a lot of damage to the discs in my neck. Uh, I had, dislocated my shoulder and had fractured something in there. I don't remember what the part's called. Sure. Um, so I had jacked my hips up, my lower back, um, TBI, traumatic brain injury. Um, and, your, and your leg. Yeah, and my knee. And so, but at first, like, none of that was visible. So at first, like, I get home and... I do the reintegration process with everybody else because I went right back. Like, I got to CAF. They were like, "Hey, man, uh, just go home for ten days. If it still hurts, go to the go to go see the emergency room or whatnot." And it, they they did that, not expecting me to come, return. Like, they thought I'd go to the hospital, they'd find something, and then I'd stay right. back here at Fort Campbell. Sure. And unfortunately, like, the thought of me staying here while others were still in danger yeah. was too much. Right. Uh, I wasn't willing to do that. I go back, uh, and I remember getting off the plane, and my first aunt was like, what are you doing? Yeah. And I was like, uh, I heard you needed some guys. You know, that was the best line I could come up with. And so I got back, and I reintegrated like everybody else. You know, and like everybody else, I lied on all the questionnaires. Right, um, right. And so I remember getting back, I remember going to the gym, like, all right, cool, well, let's do this. Let's, let's get it going. And I remember going to bench, and as soon as I... As soon as I unracked it, like it just fell and I had no strength in my left arm. Um, and so I went back to the doctor and they sent me to physical therapy. Uh, and the physical therapist is the one that discovered everything. I had my first surgery and it didn't work. So I was rushed into emergency surgery and had the second one, had part of my hip done, had my shoulder done, had my knee replaced. Like all these things are going and on. And at this and point, you're how old? 26. So you're 26. You've had like what? 10 or more surgeries? Yeah, and everybody's telling me like, oh, well, with the next one, everything's gonna get better. With the next one, everything's gonna get better. So I found my spot, myself in this spot where I'm doing everything all of you are telling me. I'm having the surgeries. I'm going to <clears throat> mental health. I'm talking to people. I'm trying to get better and nothing's changing. And so in 2012, um, I had been through the physical, I had been through the mental, nothing was changing, nothing was getting better, and I found myself in this place where if tomorrow can't be any better than today, then what's the point? Sitting in my barracks room by myself, I took a whole bottle of uh, hydrocodone and a whole bottle of Xanaflex. Um, and for the first time in almost three years, I smiled. And I laid back on the bed thinking that it was over. Uh, spoiler alert, I failed. Yeah. <laughs> Um, which is another crazy story of somebody coming into my room to see if I wanted to play video games. I didn't play video games and I hadn't ever talked to them before so it made no sense. Right. Um, and so they came in, they found me, they, their actions saved my life uh, forever. And I'm indebted to them greatly. And then life changed for me. Mm. And so that's really the first time that you ended up Coming into one of our trauma reboot trauma healing courses, um, you you know actually is kind of a neat story between you and I that I was the person who had the chance to invite you, um, and the way I hooked you was uh, I as, as you say I was I said the two words that to get any vet to come to anything which was free food. That's right. Uh, I remember sitting in the room, and you started talking about false guilt, and you started talking about how it's a tool used by the enemy to separate us further from God. Uh, and that it generally exists when there's no sin attached to it. There's nothing that we could have done. Right. Right. We convince ourselves, we replay it in our mind over and over that if we would have, should have, could have. Right. The outcome would have been different. 
when in reality it wouldn't have been. Right. I remember approaching you and asking you if we could. I remember that. Uh, if you could talk to me a little bit more because I had questions. God never wastes a pain. Hmm. Everything that I've been through in my life, everything. Yeah. He was never the cause, but he's always the answer, right? Yeah. And so Good everything word. that I've been through, he took all of that and he showed me how to use that to reach others, right? Like he uses my testimony to help other people go from victims to victors. Yeah. From, from hopeless, like I can't explain the feeling of watching somebody go from hopeless miserable, angry, bitter human beings. Yeah. And in just 12 weeks, I know. 12 weeks watching them leave as a person of peace, hope, joy. When you realize that you're not alone in your suffering, when you realize that he's with you in your suffering and whatever's going on today is preparing you for tomorrow. Right. right? Like when it's a different perspective. Yes. So if you're watching this and you've got someone in your life who's struggling, I want to give you a formula that you can use to be able to reach out to them and help them, right? The relationship that Brian and I have built over the past several years really had to begin with something. It didn't begin with me wanting him to change. It didn't begin with me wanting to help him heal. What it actually had to begin with is the first and most vital piece of the formula to having difficult conversations with people, the most vital piece to be able to actually help a person sustain change in their life, and that is grace. We had to get together and I had to say, I love you and I accept you for all of your brokenness, all of your anger, all of your meanness towards me, all of your judgment towards me, all of your, your past mistakes, I fully accept you. And, and I think grace goes one step further, right? And it says that I accept you even if you never change. That's right. And, and so to be able to say, like, I've got this grace and I'm going to accept you. And I'm also going to tell you the second ingredient, which is the truth, right? I, I love you and I accept you even if you don't accept what I'm about to say. I'm not, how, how, how you respond to what I'm about to say is not going to change how I feel. One of the biggest jobs we as Christians can do is just really start telling people the truth of what God says about them. That's right. That's not telling them the truth about how they need to change their behaviors. But none of those things can happen. And this is the pre-qualifier to that formula. So before I had to step in with grace and all that stuff to Brian's life, I had to have an invitation. He had to be willing to invite me into his situation. You heard he came up to me and said, I don't understand, but I want some help. Would you be willing to help me? And that invitation, that open door, there are people in your lives right now, I guarantee, who are giving you an open door to step in because really what they're saying is, I feel like you might be able to see an angle of my situation that in my pain, I'm not able to see. And what they're doing is they're saying, I'm counting on you to tell me the truth, but will you accept me as I am today? You know, And so whatever those people are in your life, we just want to encourage you with that formula, with those tips, to start praying. Say, would you give me an invitation? Would, God, would you help this person invite me into their pain, invite me into their trauma? And when you get there, you don't have to have answers. You have to have grace. You have to tell them the truth about what God says about them. You have to wait, and you just have to be a great listener. And you can do that. Brian and I have done it for so many people. Uh, so many others around the country have led our Reboot Trauma Healing courses for military and for first responders. And they have just went through a little bit of training to be able to do that. And you can, too. And we want to help you. So if you'd like to plug in, maybe you're hurting today and you want to go to a course, you can go to RebootAlliance.com, register for our course. Or maybe you're somebody who's ready to start helping other people. That's you can right. go to RebootAlliance.com and start a course in your own community and leave one just like Brian and I have done and so many others around the nation. Thank you so much, Brian. That was incredible. Thank you so much, man, for Thanks, being brother. here this morning. And to you, may God bless you and keep up the good work. Keep being open-minded. Keep praying for those invitations because at the end of the day, you can bring hope to those who have endured trauma. With over 10,000 titles, it would be impossible for us to show you everything on pureflix.com. But let's give it a shot.